I grew up in France in the years after the war and, um, and then moved to the States in the 60s for my studies. And uh, if I had a hero of heroes, it was Albert Camus. He's called an existentialist. He didn't like that title very much. Uh, one of the most extraordinary voices in the mid 20th century. Camus was born in 1913 in Dréan, which is part of French Algeria, which was the colony at the time. His family was known as a pied noir, black feet, because they walked on the desert. And um, they came to colonize the uh, north of Africa in the 19th century. And it was a mixed bag. Uh, some of the colonists were good and did a lot for the countries. Others were ruthless and um, took away many of the goods and didn't give them back. Camus had very mixed feelings about colonization. Um, he was raised by his Spanish mother, who was nearly deaf. And his real passion, as was mine, was football. Americans call it soccer. And um, he played on some of the national teams. Sadly, tuberculosis struck him, and he was unable to continue playing. Kind of a metaphor for his life. In 1957, Camus was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. And part of the citation read this. For his important literary production, which, with which clear-sighted earnestness illuminates the problems of the human conscience in our times. I think that's very well put. He was the conscience of much of Europe in the times after the Second World War. After Rudyard Kipling, he was the youngest recipient of the Nobel Prize. And he was the first African-born writer to receive it. He's also the shortest lived because he died tragically in 1960 of an automobile accident right outside where we used to live in southern France. He was an artiste engagé. He wrote anti-fascist plays and articles for various newspapers. And his argument was, my source comes from the heads and tails in a world of poverty and of light, a world of poverty and light, where I've lived a long time and whose memory kept me yet from the two opposite dangers which threaten every artist, bitterness and satisfaction. To make a long story short, Camus moved in the autumn of 1943 to a fascinating little town, a village really, in the center of France called Le Chambon not too far from Saint-Étienne. It was at that time in so-called free France, which was in fact heavily occupied by the Germans. And he took up residence in a little apartment there to find solace in writing. And here he began one of his most powerful novels, La Peste, The Plague. Many of you may have read it for high school French or something like that possibly based on the cholera epidemic that hit Oran, which is in North Africa, in the 19th century, uh, the plague had many different levels. It was, of course, about the story of the bubonic plague coming to that part of the world. But at a deeper level, it was surely a story about the Nazi occupation, which was indeed a plague. And at the deepest level, it's about the problem of evil. It's a Kafkaesque, dark, but remarkably powerful novel. They have many characters. It has many characters. Three of us, three of them will occupy us here. Panelou, who is the Jesuit priest. Dr. Rieu, who is the village doctor. And a kind of go-between uh, journalist named Tarou. Panelou, the priest, at first, proclaims from his pulpit that the plague is obviously connected to the sins of the people. If they turn to God, he will rescue them. But later, after witnessing the death of a child, he softens. And echoing Dostoevsky, he says, the death of a child is the ultimate expression of the mystery of evil. It is here you either believe all or reject all. In the end, the priest gets the plague, and he dies. Bernard Rieu 
is the atheist doctor. He's in fact the narrator of the story. His own wife gets the plague. At first he doesn't realize how serious is the situation, but then he does. And he begins to help more and more people and to fight against the forces of evil. He won't help people, though, for any grand theological reasons, the way Panelou might have tried. So the young man, Jean Tahou, comes to him. Uh, he comes to the town as a tourist. And uh, he's an optimistic sort of fellow. So he goes to interview Rieu and be becomes friends with him. And in the most famous conversation in the book, he asks him, how can you fight the plague? You're an atheist. You don't believe in God. And Rieu says, it's because I don't believe in God that I fight the plague. If I were the priest, I would do nothing. I would be passive and just let God act. But I'm an atheist, so I fight the creation where I find it. It's a powerful statement of fighting evil because of anger, but anger not at God because he doesn't believe in God, but at the creation, the circumstances. Now, Camus was wrestling with the problem of evil when he came to this little town. Indeed, he would wrestle with it all of his life. We know on the one hand that some evil is per perpetrated by, by humanity. And yet, on the other hand, it's far greater than you would think collective humanity could account for. Perhaps his most powerful of stories is called La Chute, the fall. Upon his untimely death in a eulogy, Jean-Paul Sartre, his friend and often rival, said that this was his most beautiful and most neglected work. Set in Amsterdam, the fall consists of a series of monologues by the self-proclaimed judge penitent Jean-Baptiste Clemence. Clemence is a play on words, clemency, peace. And um, he comes to a bar and he sits next to a stranger and begins to reflect on his life. It's a confession. Clemence tells how he was once a wealthy, successful Parisian defense lawyer. He was highly respected by his colleagues. And he did good towards all. He particularly loved to help the defenseless. And then he had a crisis, a fall from grace. And in secular terms, this is very close to the fall in the Garden of Eden. Indeed, if you know the city of Amsterdam, um, it's, a, it's a series of, of canals, many of them in, in circles. And you can't help thinking of the circles of hell in Dante's immortal poem. Clamence tells us that he used to lead this basically perfect life in Paris. The vast majority of his work centered around rescuing the widow and the orphan. And then a couple of incidents happened that shook him to the core. Late one night, he was crossing the Pont Royal on his way home from seeing his mistress. And Clamence spots a woman dressed in black leaning over the edge of the bridge. He hesitates for a moment. He kind of knows what's going on. It's a strange sight at this hour, given the barrenness of the streets. But he continues on his way nevertheless. He walked a short distance when he heard the distinct sound of a body hitting the water. Clement stops work walking, knowing exactly what was happening, but he does nothing. He doesn't really turn around. He just moves on. The sound of screaming was, and I'm quoting the novel, repeated several times as it went downstream. Then it abruptly ceased. The silence that followed as the night suddenly stood still seemed interminable. I wanted to run and yet didn't move an inch. I was trembling, I believe, from cold and shock. I told myself that I had to be quick and felt an irresistible weakness steal over me instead. I've forgotten what I thought then, probably too late, too far, or something of the sort. I was still listening as I stood motionless. Then, slowly in the rain, I went away. 
I told no one. And so he confesses this and a number of other sins of omission and commission to his friend in the bar. And in the process, he considers himself deeply involved with justice, but incapable of fighting against it in an effective way. Everything happens as though God did not exist. God is powerful and good, and if he is, evil could not exist as it does. Camus wrestled with this, and we don't know where he was in 1960 on that fateful day. I would like to think he had some contact with uh, Christians. I would like to think that he moved towards the Christian position. And um, one of the most astonishing things, and one of the things that makes me think he was drawn to the Christian faith, is that this little village, Le Chambon, where he wrote La Peste, was populated by Huguenot Protestant believers. And it distinguished itself as being one of the only towns in all of France which harbored thousands of Jews, many of them children, from sure deportation. It's one of the great untold stories of heroism in the Second World War. A powerful documentary was made of it by Pierre Sauvage, who was born a Jew in that city, in that town, because of the Huguenots. And he went and he interviewed uh, the people to, to find out what it was that drove him, them to such heroism. How did they have such courage to protect so many Jews, double the size of the town, at great expense, at great risk? Most of them shrugged their shoulders and said, you know, it's pretty simple. God says, love him and love your neighbor. That's all we were doing. We weren't heroes. We were just doing what God says to do. There's a little more to it than that because they had themselves been heavily persecuted, and they knew a thing or two about the book, the Bible, and that they shared a lot of it with, with the Jews. Um, but Camus surely saw some of this, and he surely saw that these people were acting in a way very different from so many, as he called them, cowards, les lâches, in his um, surroundings, who were incapable of fighting the plague, even though they might have wanted justice. And I think he wrestled with this all of his life. I'd love to think that maybe he ended up on the right side of things. We, we just don't know. There's something very attractive about this philosophy. It cares profoundly about injustice and suffering. And it refuses easy answers, such as he imagines the priest had. If God exists, I'll just lie down and let him act. It refuses easy answers that attach evil to, to God in an unbiblical way. For my money, this philosophy is a lot better than so many others that wrestle with the problem of evil, calling it illusion uh, or calling it something we heroically must overcome in a sort of stoic manner. Like Camus, we can see how dark is the plague. We sense human guilt. But unlike Camus, the biblical vision, realistic as it is, finds the ultimate meaning for all things, even the problem of evil, in the presence of God, not his absence. On every page of Scripture, indeed, God demonstrates that he hates evil. He is of purer eyes than to even look at evil. He admonishes the reader, never confuse right for wrong. This is the meaning that God gives to all things to begin with. But of course, the deeper question is, how could he allow it? To that question, there may never be a clear human rational answer. Because as soon as you trespass into that territory, it's pretty difficult not to blame God. And yet, all of the biblical wisdom suggests it doesn't suggest, it tells us that God is not to blame, yet he is sovereign. If you give up one side or the other, you've given up a lot. But the Bible clearly tells us that the perpetrators of evil is none other than ourselves. You know the story of Solzhenitsyn when he 
discovered or rediscovered the transcendence of God in the gulag because of the death of his dear friend, Dr. Kornfeld. He came to this conclusion. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil, he said, cuts through every heart, the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? If it is we who are evil, how can God come to us without destroying us? And yet he doesn't. Instead of destroying us, God fights against evil, first the evil of sin, and then the evil of injustice in the world. But unlike the, the doctor who said that I fight creation where I find it, God refuses to blame circumstances, but he finds a way to solve the problem of evil by blaming himself, he who did not deserve any blame. The powerful story of uh, Jesus and Lazarus recounted in John 11 uh, reminds us that Christ hated the plague. You, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And as you may know, twice in that text, whereas the traditional translations say he groaned within himself, the Greek word there is a much stronger word. It says he was livid with the fury of a caged animal. When he saw Mary weeping at the tomb, he was livid with the fury of a caged animal. He didn't hate the creation or the creator. He hated the cancer of sin. But unlike the doctor who was powerless to go beyond just physical healing, Christ came and healed the entire problem. One week later, after he had released Lazarus from his tomb, he would go into his own tomb and take upon himself the sins of the whole world. But he would also be raised up from the dead and begin the greatest campaign against evil that ever was. God so loved the world that he sent his only son to take the guilt and the sin of mankind upon him so that whoever believed in him could be not only reconciled to God, but could begin to fight the plague big time. The way I like to put this sometimes is that our real problem is not the problem of evil, it's the problem of good. How could we have a God who is so good, who loves us so much, that he's willing to dig deep down into the muck of our sin and be called guilty when he was innocent, to become sin for us and yet be raised from the dead. That is the bigger mystery. How can God be so good? How can he be so loving? I don't know, but I'm planning to worship him in eternity for that. And while we're waiting, I'm planning to be like the Chambonnet, who fought the plague. In their case, it was the persecution of the Jews. And they did it not because they were existential heroes tearing their hair out, but because, hey, that's what you do as a Christian. You love God and you love your neighbor. Yeah, as James puts it, you come and proffer justice on the person who has no access to power. And you do it because of what God has done for you. If God is innocent from evil and yet somehow responsible for the way the world is, he has proven himself worthy of our working alongside with him to fight against the plague because he led in the battle and he continues to lead in the battle. He's the divine warrior who puts down all enemies of the good. But he does it in his own way and in his own time. That, I find, is maybe the hardest part of the question. Why doesn't he just wipe it all out and bring us the new heaven and the new earth? My favorite spiritual, one of them, I guess I have a lot of favorites, but is the spiritual that, that says, God don't come when you want him to, but he's always right on time. 